Joseph and Jacob for another evening of Modern Minds on Jewish Matters. We have the privilege to host this evening a woman with an incredible story, Kay Wilson. Kay Wilson is a British-born Israeli jazz pianist, cartoonist, and tour guide who survived the barbaric terror attack while hiking in the Jerusalem forest in December 2010. She and her friend Christine Lukin were ambushed by two Palestinian terrorists, were bound, gagged, stabbed repeatedly. Her friend was murdered, was killed. and Kay managed somehow to escape, to survive, and to live, to tell her story and to be here this evening, uh, to fly here to LA to share her incredible, inspiring story with all of us. Kay is an educator for Stand With Us. She also works together with the organization One Family. And this evening was organized by the One Family organization. It's a very important organization, the leading organization that rehabilitates, that supports, that rebuilds the lives of all of the Israeli terror victims. And so that's such an important um, organization in Israel and for us to care deeply about. And I welcome uh, Tedra Bro and Larry Cohen uh, from the East Coast and on the board of One Family. And thank, thanks to One Family for organizing tonight's lecture. So, what we're going to do is um, we're going to show a brief video um, about One Family. One Family sponsored and organized the lecture, so we're going to be showing it a brief video about one family and uh, just to raise awareness and get us into understanding about the uh, Israeli terror victims and what the organization does to support them and which is something of course that we care deeply about. Um, if you want to learn more about the organization after the evening of course I encourage you to go to the website online to find the one family organization. And then afterwards we'll go right into uh, Kay Wilson who will begin to speak and I've just met her tonight for the first time, but I've seen a number of her talks on video, online. I've heard so much about her, and I'm sure and I know that you're going to find her. She exemplifies uh, determination, courage, optimism, and these are such important lessons for us to learn um, as we are confronted as individuals, as a nation, with all of our challenges. So thank you so much all for being here. Thank you, Kate, so much um, for your courage. Um, and for being here tonight to share your story with us that I'm sure is going to be so inspiring. Um, let's go right now to the, uh, to the video. Injury from all that got her. 
When we got to the hospital, my mom's heart didn't beat. So the doctor like shocked it and then stopped pumping, but she was in a vegetated state. She was in that stage for nine and a half years. I remember like every single moment of the bombing. I remember it like a disaster. My name is Abhi Khuja. On the 1st of December 2001, a suicide bomber exploded next to me. I was 14 years old. I hope it took a deal. אני הייתי בעברית, הייתי קודם כל היה את הריח ואחר כך הייתה דממה מוחלטת אחרי כמה שניות התחילה הסרחות אני ישר אמרתי שהיה בלבד הסתובבתי ראיתי את הרגליים שאני מעוותות אמרו רק על משהו שאני נקרא קיבלתי מעל מעמד אדם, וכל אדם שנכנס לי לגוף, הכל יצא לי מאחורי מרגליים. הרופאים הוציאו לי מהרגליים, מעל מעל הסבלים, פרגים, אומים, ובתוך כל זה המחבל, המחבלים, הם שמו בעורה על החברים. הייתי מוקדמת ומאושרת. We used to work as a nurse in the hospital and he was waiting for me then. He didn't come. My husband picked up my son in the middle of the way and the arms and he threw a big stone. on the car and my husband died from this stone immediately and then the car falling down and my son was killed. In this time I was pregnant. Four months after that I got birth from a baby girl and her name is the orbit. It's my life light. She is my meaning of my life.
Shalom. Wow, I'm so excited I can hardly wait to hear myself speak. <laughs> but, but thanks for turning up. Thank you, Rabbi Tav, and also thank you to Rabbi Arie Safrin, who I've met over a couple of glasses of wine yesterday and also today had a most intriguing conversation. And please make sure if you text your question, it will be, Kelly, would you like to come out for another glass of wine afterwards, all right? Uh, so I hope my story will bring <coughs> uh, hope, and it's a real honor to uh, speak to this uh, incredible organization who's helped me personally. So let me skip over the first 19 boring years of my tedious life in that great little colony over there. I will hop straight to Israel. I've uh, been living there 30 years, and as the rabbi said, I'm a tour guide. December the 18th, 2010, I'm with an American Christian friend, Christine Lucan, who incidentally, I met her when I was guiding a historical tour of the Holocaust in Sotibor. I met her in a forest. And she was saying Kaddish, the Jewish people. And I think that's important to, uh, to say that before I carry on with the narrative. So it's a beautiful Shabbat day. Blue skies, gorgeous fragrant pines, and we're on the Israel National Trail near Beit Shemesh. And I recall a guiding point, an overview, and I take her up to the top, and we're sitting there on a rock, and I'm showing her the valley, pointing out where we were earlier in the day. <clears throat> and as I'm showing her, I suddenly see like 60 feet away, down the slope of the hill, I see two men crouched in the bushes. Now, as I said, I've been there 30 years. I've worked with Arabs as a job, with a, as a guide. I have Arab friends, I have Palestinian friends, and I can tell they're Palestinian. So I signaled to Christine not to make a sound in the hope that they hadn't seen us. But sure enough, one stands up, and he says, yes, have you got any water? So, ooh. so I, uh, not wanting to antagonize them, uh, and I certainly didn't want them to come closer, I just answered back in Hebrew. I said, Alavai, I wish, and they went away. So Christine, she's not privy to Hebrew, and she said, what was that about? I said, oh, they wanted water, you know, but I was feeling nervous. So I thought maybe they wanted to steal my backpack. So I said, let's get back to the car, about a mile away. Yeah. And I take out my pen knife, because really, if they were going to come and grab the backpack, I didn't want them to steal my car keys, my ID, my money. And we be begin walking back down through the thicket. She's behind me. Suddenly, I hear her scream. And as I turn around, it feels like somebody has rammed me in the back with a log. I crash to the ground. My nose splits open. My lips split open. And this man, one of the men, is on my back, and I managed to wiggle over, and now he's kneading his way up my chest. Um, I see his crotch, and I try and circumcise him. <coughs> I miss. And I like to tell the young people, by the way, well, that doesn't matter how young you are. That is the only time in life that size really does matter. Okay? <coughs> so I missed. But I did manage to lick him in the leg. But he's bigger than me, he overpowers me, takes away my pen knife. And uh, hoists me to my feet, sticks his hand inside his jacket, and he takes out a machete. Cheer up, it's going to get worse. Okay, and that machete is a foot long, two and a half inches wide, and it's a serrated blade. And we are standing there. Could somebody just say Jesus in the synagogue? <laughs> oh, no, that's really, that's quite, uh, quite remarkable, really. <laughs> So we're standing there, and Christine is being held at knife point by another man who's got his arm around her neck and a kitchen knife to her throat. And we are there in, for half an hour in the most, one of the most beautiful places in Israel, except for the desert, in my opinion. And the birds are uh, at the shrill, they're tweeting, and the crickets are chirping, and the bees are buzzing, and the flies are humming, and I can smell the pines, and the skies are azure blue and the sun is on our face, the most beautiful of situations that we're being held at knife point for half an hour. And the physical reaction is, I mean, from nowhere, I, I'm sweating, I'm drenched in sweat, and my tongue is so huge, it looks like a pillow covered in sandpaper. And, and I'm just late, lately shaking, and I'm like potato head, you know, I, I, I can't even speak. And he grabs my backpack, 
starts going through it and takes out Christine's passport. And Christine, she was very brave, and she said in English, obviously, she said, I'm an American Christian. And then I said, yeah, I'm an American Christian. Having forgotten that I'd spoken to them in Hebrew about the water. <clears throat> but soon enough, he takes out uh, he takes out my purse, or you guys call it a wallet, right? And uh, he's going through it, you know, his little chubby fingers. And I'm thinking, oh God, I hope he doesn't find my Israeli ID. And I'm praying, and trust me, Jews, listen to me, people pray when they're frightened. And I'm praying, God, please don't let him find it. And sure enough, he takes out my Israeli ID. And the game's up, so I start to converse with him in Hebrew, and time is ticking on. I'm thinking, what, what does he want? I stabbed him. <coughs> Excuse me, I stabbed him. He didn't stab me back. They didn't rape us, thank God. And I'm telling him now in Hebrew, take the car. I'm a tall guy, all these things, they're not interesting. And it's confusion. It's half an hour, half an hour, which is an eternity. Half an hour of, of fear, confusion debilitating uncertainty, half an hour of hope, maybe they're going to let us go, the delusion of reprieve, half an hour of unadulterated terror. Finally, one of them moves away and he makes a phone call, and I know some conversational Arabic, and I can hear they are coordinating with a car. And this is when, Gal uh, what's his name, uh, Gilad Shalit, remember our soldier? And I'm thinking, oh my goodness, we're going to be kidnapped. And it's like a new wave of shock, you know, it's like a bathtub full of water. <coughs> Somebody puts the plug out and the water just goes down, like right? everything is drained from you. And he comes back and he says, uh, take off your shoes. I think, what does he want with my shoes? Take out the laces. And they tie our hands behind our back. Then the other one takes Christine's fleece and he hacks it up. And then he gags us, takes off my glasses. He draws in closer and he sees my Magin David, Star of David, and he says in Arabic, Shuhade. And I said, Is it Magin David? It's a Star of David. So he takes that off. So there we are, gag bound barefoot, standing side by side, and I'm waiting now for them to push us through the thicket into the main road and off to Gaza or Iran, I don't know where. And instead of that, one of them pushes me on my knees, head forward. And then I see a light, and it's the sun glinting off his machete. And I prepare myself to be beheaded. No, I wasn't. And, <coughs> and the forest rings out with Allah Akbar, the Islamic creed of faith. I hear a muffled squeal. Christine says, Jesus help me. And through the vomit behind my gag, I gurgle Shema Islam. And he stabs me so hard in the back, I crash to the ground and he leans on my side. And every time he plunges that machete into me, I can hear my bones crunch. And it's a serrated edge, which gets stuck in bone. So as he tugs it out, <coughs> I hope you all eat him. As he tugs it out, my blood is like a fountain. I can see it. It's just burning everywhere and the only thing I can do is like I all these thoughts are going through my mind, you know, I'm forty six years old, I'm being murdered. I'm never gonna see again the people I love and God please give me one more chance and I realise the only chance I have is to play dead. So I tried not to move. The pain was beyond description and I kept my eyes open because that's how people die. And I watched the most sacred sight five feet away of a human being chopped up before my eyes. They leave and a few seconds pass and I'm laying on my side and then I feel these footsteps and they're coming back. And one rolls me over on my back and now I'm looking up at the pines and I see the most glorious sunset <coughs> which is obscured by the silhouette of a man's hand that God made clutching a machete and I watched him plunge it into my chest and I didn't flinch, blink, move. And it missed my heart by four millimeters. Okay. They leave. It does get funny at some point, guys. Honestly, please stay for the rest of the year, all right? Especially as I'm on an, on an area, you know, people walking out already. But they leave 
And uh, I have one last goal in life, and that is to die nearer to where I parked the car so the police could find my body. And I managed to stand, get the bound after three times. There's a big ravine right down beside me. I thought, well, I'm going to die anyway. If I fall down there, that's all right. But at least I tried. Managed to stand. And I turned my back on my friend, or what's left of her. And step by step, I begin to walk. And as I walk, I listen to the sounds of life. I hear those birds. Not a care in the world, and I can hear the bees and the flies and the crickets, and I can hear the breeze and the rustling of the leaves, and it's it's caressing my face, which is caked in blood and sweat, and I have vomit behind my gag. I'm using my tongue to try to shift it aside, and I'm aware that I'm listening to life, but I'm also listening to death, and I hear this bubbling and a gurgling, and it's my lungs filling with blood, and I'm ever aware that the next step could be my last. But then I also hear music. I hear, have we got any musicians here? I don't mean clarinet stuff, I mean real music. Right, none of this Polish have a manila. <laughs> I mean jazz. And I hear D flat major nine and G flat minor. And in order not to think about my friend, and in order to reach my grave, I start to compose an arrangement of Somewhere Over the Rainbow, which was written by two cantors, Jewish cantors, as opposed to Christian ones, two Jewish ones, in 1938 when Hitler was trampling over Austria. And that song speaks about hope for a better world. And thinking about this arrangement, I managed to walk all the way back to the car. I walked over a mile. I also orientated myself, and I'll just give you the injuries because there's nothing like a bit of a kvetch, is it? I had six ribs that had snapped and were poking out of my back. I don't want anyone complaining about arthritis after this, all right? right? I mean, really, please give me a break. I don't care. This is the face of somebody who doesn't care. I had six ribs that had snapped. Really, sticking out of my back, I had 30 additional fractures, I had bones which had splintered off into my lungs, I had a crushed sternum, a broken shoulder blade, a dislocated shoulder, and 13 machete wounds in my lungs and diaphragm, and in that state, gagged, bound, barefoot, I walked uphill for over a mile. I get to the picnic table, there's a couple of families there, they, they, they give the police a call, the army a call, I'm rushed to hospital, nee, 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 nee. you know, I have to do the sound effects now. I get to Hadassah in Cabo. All right? I mean, they, they, they rip my clothes off, and it's like they're squelching, they're so soggy in blood. And there's all these doctors around in surgical masks. And there's one guy, and he's holding a scalpel, a big fat, shiny scalpel. And the other hand, he's got like a tube, and it's a lung drain. And he turns his head, and he's got a, what do you call it, a ponytail? He's a Californian. I mean, it doesn't really install confidence. <laughs> You know what I mean? That, that dude, that dude is totally going to like slice me open without an anesthetic and bore that lung drive into me. And that's what that dude did, you know what I mean? And I, I really, I remember because he got the surgical mask and every time he'd breathe in, it was like he was sucking on a joint, you know? <laughs> and it really, and I heard myself scream and I rushed into the operating theatre of coexistence and the last words, well I won't tell you the last words, I hear, I hear two surgeons talking about goat cheese in between like, yeah, you have to do this, yeah, 13 years, one of our heart, you know, well you have to add a little bit of vinegar and it's like, what are we talking about, my body or the goat cheese? And anyway, the last words I hear was from a Jewish surgeon to his Arab colleague who said, Muhammad, me the sake. Muhammad, give me the knife. It was an Arab Israeli surgeon who saved my life. Now, I wake up, as you can tell, and I've been in Israel 30 years, okay? 20 years in Tel Aviv, got to the point where I'm completely bilingual, and I've got tubes here, tubes here, tubes, tubes everywhere. I sound like a honking goose. I can hardly breathe. And at the end of my bed is a policeman, and he says, what? Your name. 
and I thought this is not the time to be practicing your English. <laughs> and I, I hiss, I hiss, okay. Family, it's like watching somebody crack open a safe, you know, like get on with it. But what's your family name? I said, Wilsa. And he writes it down. And then he says, you? I mean, every sentence, every syllable is a new sentence. You? You? Like, hurry up, I'm going to be dead in a minute. You? America? And I thought, screw you, I'm British. <laughs> I, I mean, I never thought to speak in Hebrew, so I say, England. And so he's writing all this down, and then he says, uh, you have telephone? You know, you give me a phone number, I remember the fax number of a friend, and I, and I only know it in Hebrew. And I'm telling you, the look on his face like Messiah had come. <laughs> beaming, or Willy Wonka's golden ticket had been found. He's beaming from ear to ear. And he says, you speak Hebrew very nice. <laughs> and he gets up, no kidding, the last words he said to me was, welcome to Israel. <laughs> I mean, how hectic is that? Now, oh, I just remember that I've got so many funny stories. I mean, I have friends of all, all the identities and religions, and I remember one day in the hospital, uh, I mean, I was under, I was, there was a, what do you call it, blackout. <coughs> and, uh, and one of the things that happens with avoidance, and that's part of the trauma, is you think about everything but, you know, you're actually, it's, it's on the verge of insanity. And I don't have much to think about, it, so all I have is this monitor, you know, a heart monitor. So I was composing a lot. That was like the, that was the contrabass, you know. And uh, it, it, it really is a journey of insanity. And uh, a couple of days after the murder, I'm thinking, okay, I've done Saturday night, I've done over the rainbow, and then I started thinking about my favourite pianist, who happens to be Canadian, Oscar Peterson. All right, now please don't tell me you've never heard of Oscar Peterson. I have to say this for the narrative. He was fat and black, okay? And his name was Oscar. That's all you need to know. We'll talk, we'll get text to musical questions, all right? What's your favorite song? Anyway, so I'm thinking about Oscar, this big, black, fat Canadian pianist. And in walk, six men with bald heads in the middle of the night with sunglasses. And they're white and they're iron and they're rigid. And one guy, you know, he grabs a chair and he says to me in Hebrew, Shalom Kay, my name is Oscar. <laughs> and I'm looking up and down. And I, the first words I said to the Shin Bet, it was the Shin Bet, I said, Do you play the piano? <laughs> and he looks at me like with regret. He says, No, but you know, it's never too late. It's kind of like, so, I'm having this bizarre conversation with the shin bed. And uh, I managed to retain all the details, what they looked like. I even sketched them. And he says, we'll get them. We'll get them. But I was sworn to secrecy. So meanwhile, the tabloids are having a party. Not all of them. So I learned in hospital that I was a lesbian Christian tourist, and I probably murdered my friend. But all that charm, I do think that's funny. Yeah, I mean, you know, especially the tourist bit. Yeah, you know, let's get on with it. But, uh, I'm released from hospital. I spent, by the way, two years on my back. Uh, I, uh, yeah, um, but that's, that's not really relevant. But there was nothing they could do, you know? You can, how many groups could you stick together? And I begin the process, the lifelong process of trauma therapy. And six weeks after the murder, you know, it's like I could only wear like loose clothes. I'm walking like a geriatric. No offense to the elderly people here, but they like speed by me, you know? And uh, I'm coming out of hospital six weeks, and I get in this taxi, and uh, there's the driver who's like a Maccabi Tel Aviv fan, you know, his taxi is painted yellow and blue, it's a soccer team. Oh no, it's basketball, I don't care, I hate sport. Anyway, and so there's him, and then next to him, next to him is a religious man, like modern, or like a rabbi, like a good rabbi here, but with a black thing. Uh, and like, and, and in the back, and I say this for a reason, okay, because uh, I was very traumatized, I need space. But next to me was a lady who was like 11 times my size. No kidding. I was a little bit of an exaggeration. So I'm like squeezed up against the window, 
driving along, and the driver turns the radio on, and I suddenly hear my name. And it's a police conference. And it says, because of Kay's courage, she stabbed the guy, and the DNA on her knife helped us catch the murderers, and that you can give me a standing ovation at any time you want. But not yet, not yet, not yet, not yet. <laughs> Checks made payable to Kay Wilson. All right, but anyway, so they, they got the murders, and also 13 man Hamas terror cell. And this is this, this is really, really super. There was another Israeli woman murdered 10 months previously called Netta Blatzorek. And once again, the tabloids engaged in gossip. Netta committed suicide. No, she didn't. She was murdered. And they confessed the murder in her as well. So that murder was solved. They cut, got the murders and the 13 man terror cells. So all this is going on in the radio. This is the day of the Arab Spring. And I was the headline. And the pandemonium in the taxi, like the driver is slapping the wheel, he says, Here's a Yofi, that's amazing. And the religious gentleman is like, Oh, Hashem, oh, Hashem, oh, Hashem, oh, Hashem. <laughs> I love it, I love it. Like, Go for it, man. And this, this lady, <laughs> this lady next to me, she's Russian immigrant, she's got like no sleeves, you know, very low necked, and she, she was overcome with emotion. And I, I thought, you know, I want some credit. <laughs> And it's also, my face is covered with sweat, that's not even mine. And she's like rocking me back and forth. Is it boobalip, boobalip? I can't breathe. So that's how fast. So I get out, and the driver lets me out. And I'm sitting there, uh, it was in the old city in Jerusalem. I'm sitting on David's city, and I'm like in pyjamas and a fleece. I'm thinking, what had happened to my life? You know, I can't believe, I'm so traumatized. Suddenly, Allah, walk up, the Islamic call a prayer. Right? It's a, we're a democratic country. I must have freaked out. Well, I did freak out, but I didn't recall because the next thing I did is I find myself in the police station and I'm aching. And it's just me and one police officer. And I, I'm thinking, I know I've done something bad. <laughs> Story of my life. And no, I don't say that. And he looks at me and he says, You know? And I thought, what is it with the police in English? <laughs> Here we go again. And he says, you know, in Israel, <laughs> in Israel, the Israel police, like everybody could be happy. Happy is happy. And I'm thinking, this is a trip. This is better than any medical cannabis. Trust me, this is amazing. Wow. As we like the Muslim to be happy. The Jewish, the Christian, and then he looks me up and down and he says, I'm a tourist. I am not a tourist. What is it about me that he's not a tourist? And I'm like shocked. I think I don't know what this guy wants. And he says, You know, in. <laughs> you settle down, Beatty, I can change it really clear you're a very rowdy lot. Anyway, so, you know, in Israel, sometimes the tourists go a little bit crazy. And then he stands up and proceeds to show me just how he did a bit crazy. I don't. I went. I was. So, apparently, when I was outside, the call to prayer went off, Allah Akbar, and I did this. Wing, wing. I was scratching this other policeman's face. And then apparently I was kicking people. And he sits down. I mean, there was something so compassionate about this man. You know, he's sweating from the exertion. And he sits down and he says, you know, my English, gooder and gooder. <laughs> but I'm, and I th and something, you know, so moving, it's so honest. And it, it broke me. And I said to him in flawless Hebrew, I said, you know what, your English isn't bad. There is room for it. No, 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 he said, you're Israeli, you're, you're a Hebrew speaker, you're Jewish, you made me do a pantomime, you assault my officers, 
He said, I've had enough. What's your name? And he's taking a statement. And I'm like, I was like, okay. Family name. Well, sir. Profession. Tall guy. And he stops. And he says, you're okay? You're the Hamas? You? And I'm like, yeah, yeah. And then I had this meltdown. I was like banging my head on the desk. And I was like, they murdered her. They fucking murdered my friend. You know, I was like, tall the vol. Darkness on the face of the earth, and like snot coming out of my nose, and I'm screaming, I'm crying, and it's, I just keep my head down. And then there was cake. <laughs> <laughs> I get up, I and mean, I lift my head up, and the room is full of policemen with bulging biceps and M16s, and they, they've got chocolate cake around their mouth, and Barney the dinosaur Coca Cola, and they're giving me a toast. Because I, you know, I got an upgrade from being a Christian lesbian tourist murderer to a Jewish national hero. And at the end of this little celebration, the, the officer, he's so funny, he's, he stands up and he's doing it now for the laugh, and he says in English, you know, he had this thing, he had this thing with his right hand, it didn't concern him, but he says, you know, in Israel, you are the only person in Jewish history to really kill the police get congratulations and a free ride home. <laughs> so they, they took me home in the, in the police van. Now, nine months after the murder, I have to go to court. There was no forensic doubt, obviously, because of the blood on my knife. And if you don't remember anything else, I heard it from their lips and I have the document. Christine Lucan, an American Christian, was murdered because they thought she was Jewish. That's the only reason they say it themselves. But nevertheless, it's a democracy. Court. I mean, haven't I been through enough? I've never been to court. Except for like speeding, you know? Oh, and that bank robbery, but apart from that. Really. <laughs> no, but it's like, I've been to court. And I, 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 mean, I imagine like a room like this, something really austere, wood panel walls and high ceilings. I walk in, it's like a kindergarten. Plastic chairs, like one tenth this size. Christine Lucan's parents had turned up. I had never met them before. I didn't know Christine that very well. I couldn't look at them. The survivor's guilt at the time was beyond describable. Netta's parents, the other lady, I shared a lot of their grief, you know, because we became very close. I couldn't look at them. So the only people I could look at were the ones who tried to murder me. And we sat 15 feet away. Obviously, they're shackled. I wasn't scared. I wasn't, like, relishing it, you know. But given the choice, I would rather be there than in a country music club, but that's another, another discussion for another day. So they're opposite me, and I say, I have to look up. And I'm expecting this like incubus that I, that I met previously in the forest with towels and sweat and ugly guys, you know. And I look up, and you know what I saw? I saw two people, and it was so shocking. They looked so normal. And I'm confused, I'm bewildered. How can two men who were once little boys grow up and hold a machete in one hand, a mulber in the other, and hack at two innocent women without blinking an eye? And it's the incentive of your taxpayers' money given Palestinian authority. And there would be the emotions in the court, you know. Uh, it was like rage, you know, I think I, I have the right to rage. I don't forgive evil. And then the grief and the survivor's guilt. But there's a verse in the Talmud, Rabbi, you'll have to help me quote it. It says, all the Israel is responsible for each other. And there was something so... Uh, Nahor. Did you all hear that? Talk to your Rabbi afterwards. <laughs> so, uh, but you know, it was that like everybody wanted to help everybody else. There was about 30 people in the room, and you got 30 translators, you got 30 lawyers, you know, everybody knows best. I found it very heartwarming. And in fact, the whole court case was quite interesting because if you, you've obviously been to Israel, it would, it would be like in American court, be order, order. And in Israel, it's like, <laughs> you know, or uh, objection. Objection overruled. <laughs> uh, and, oh, and the best one is like, but this is the best one. And how does the defendant plead? <laughs> well, it wasn't that bad. 
But anyway, they got, uh, they got, they got the one who murdered Christine, Zichonotaka, also murdered Netta. He got 120 years, and the one who uh, tried to murder me got 20 years for my attempted murder and 35 years life. That's what it is in Israel for Christine's. And at the end of the court, this guy comes up. I don't even know who they were. There's so many people from Arabs, Jews, all came to support. This guy says, so how are you? And in therapy, I'd done a list of my losses, and I said, well, you want to know? I've lost my friend, my health, my home. I had to give everything away. I lived on people's sofas for two years. I lost the dignity of being able to provide for myself. I lost my vocation. I've lost, my, uh, I've lost weight, sleep, night, day, routine, the ability to even answer how I am. And hearing somebody pray and beg for their life, I've lost my innocence. And he looks at me and he says, wow, so what else is going on with you? <laughs> and there was something really, uh, it was like a catalyst, you know, something very profound about that. And that, that got me on a path of thinking. And I, I'll say it again, I do not forgive. I think it's immoral to forgive evil. I cannot forget. I live with this every time I breathe. I've been pain every time I breathe. But I will not live in hatred. Okay, and it means that I'm going to choose life, and that's that's what I'm managing to do, just second by second. And I found one of the things that's been really helpful for me, apart from one family who've been absolutely incredible. By the way, let me just tell you a little anecdote with one family. With Netta, the other lady got murdered, she has an 11-year-old daughter, and uh, her name was Noga, and Noga couldn't speak. She was in so much grief. And one family, sent her off to a camp, summer camp, and that it changed that little girl's life. And she even came back to give a eulogy over her mother's third year memorial. So one of the things, apart from one family that's helped me, is to actually uh, think of, like, what, what does it mean to be a Jew? And the word Jew, I'm sure you all know this, it means two things, lodot, to recognize, acknowledge, and lodot, same word, to be thankful for. And I recognize, I acknowledge that I don't know why it happened. It just did. We were in the wrong place at the wrong time. And I recognize that God didn't do this. Man did this. And that means I choose in gratitude to see the sunset and not just the machete that obscures the sun. And I choose with thankfulness to listen out to the birds and not just hear the whimper of my friend. And I choose with a grateful heart to inhale those fragrant pines and not just smell the stench of vomit behind my gag. So for me, it's a daily step-by-step -step walk through Gates of Madrid. I would say the valley of the shadow of death. And I know there is no shadow without any light so on two, two uh, on how do you say, psychology of the Muslim, cheap shrink psychology, I've learned that life is this very present moment, that's all we have, with any certainty. I've learned that life is engaged in random and senseless acts of kindness. It's rushing outside when it starts to rain, it's turning C major to C major 9 with a flat 13th in the bass. I learned that life is making somebody giggle. It's stroking puppy ears. It's giving somebody a call just to hear their voice. It's letting people off the hook. It's engaging with people I've never met. It's accepting the past and embracing the now, acknowledging the future and living in the present. And I have learned that every single moment, every single second, every single hour, is nothing less than a miracle. And I'll conclude with this, and I say this hundreds of times a day, because I want to. Modami lefebecha. Melechai lekayam shechzata bi nishmati lechemna. Rabba emunatecha. I give thanks to you, I live in an eternal king. Because in your compassion you've restored my very breath. Great is your faithfulness. Amen and thank you for listening.
very kind, you're going to make me blush. So we've got the text in questions, right? If you make a really, really, really big fat donation to one family, I mean, I mean six digits, I don't want any of this, like $20,000 job. I'll take off my shirt and show you my staples. <laughs> Well, the, the practical steps that I would take, and I'm trying to do it as if I also have British citizenship, if you couldn't tell by my impediment. But what I'm trying to do is uh, lobby the governments, stop the funding of the Palestinian Authority. Your taxpayers' money are being paid to the people who murdered an American Christian. They have a monthly execution stipend. You should be talking to your congressman or however it works over here. That's the first thing you could do. Because there's no incitement without funding. So lobby your but you can write emails, do whatever. But please, please do that because it's an absolute outrage that you're actually unwittingly funding terrorism. Another one is what tools do you use to help you fight against possibly coming to hate? What tools do I use to fight against hating others? But first of all, I hate evil. I don't like to think about these murderers, alright, but I I have to you know, I, they're not getting off. I don't, they don't, I don't give them wiggle room. I think we should hate evil, we should despise evil. But I have many Arab friends. In fact, my Arab bus driver gave me a ring with Shmai Slayer on it. You know, he came to court. It was so funny. He'd talk about those Arabs. Those Arabs, those bastards. You know what I mean? And so I've always had relationships with uh, Arab friends. And obviously, it was an Arab surgeon who saved my life. So my criticism is with the Palestinian Authority, okay? So that we have to be honest with our criticism. So I think we hate evil and we choose what to hate. But I mean, I'm obviously you might have got it. I'm no angels, you know what I mean? I'm not like Mother Bloody Teresa or something. I'm a case there was a few people who thought I was. I mean, I, I have really horrible days too where, I mean, in court I could have like sliced them open myself. I would have enjoyed it. Enjoyed it, but we are we have to own our right to rage, but we have to rage at the right things. Can I ask one more? Um, has the Israeli government been involved at all in rehabilitation? I am so pro Israel, you can tell that, can't you? The Israeli government sucks. <laughs> has the Israeli government been involved in my rehabilitation? No, I am pro-Israel, but look, the Israeli government do not look after Holocaust survivors. It's, it's a disgrace, and we have a free press. We're a de democracy. We can criticize our government. I mean, you think this is fun? Actually, it's fun. But, you know, I'd rather be talking about jazz or wine. But the Israeli government, and this is where one family steps in. We have something called the Israel National Insurance, all right? Because we're really we're born-again communists, let's be honest. And it's a socialistic state in that sense. And if you're in a terror attack, you, uh, you get a disability allowance, or you're supposed to. And look, for, I'll tell you my story, okay, I mean, I went broke, bankrupt, everything. Uh, and they decided, I mean, I went to my first medical committee where you have to pay for second opinions, you have to pay a lawyer. And I was so traumatized, I wasn't crying, I was just like, numb. And they say to me, I mean, forget the physical injuries, the mental thing. They say, how are you? And I said, fine. I said, oh, that's great. That was it. That was it. And I, you know what I got from the Israeli government? I got an exemption from paying everybody. If you have a television, you have to pay a TV license. I got an exemption from paying the license, and I don't even have a television. <laughs> so I am fighting this for five years. You know, I mean, it's not nice to even ask. I've never asked for money. Really, and there's something about not being able to work, which is very difficult. It takes away a person's dignity. So the government, in that respect, the government absolutely sucks. And uh, one family are, are very good with that. They provide legal service to a lot of the survivors of terrorism. We have time for any more, Rabbi? Or?
Oh, concluding message. It's so simple. Get out your checkbooks and write and really, I mean, I mean, I'm serious. I mean, I live in the present. Please, please, anything you can give will help people. And I wouldn't be in the same state I was today, which is a terrible state, if it wasn't for one family. Please, please give generously. Diaspora Jewish people, we need you in Israel. We're one family. We're one community. And we're standing up. This is happening nearly every single day in Israel. And people, terror destroys. You know, what's that verse from the Bible? With their bloods cry out. It's in the plural. We're talking about generations that are affected with every single um, stabbing or murder that goes on. So please, I ask respectfully, but please give generously to this organization. I, and I vouch personally for it. And there's, there's, it's, it's an NGO where the money goes to where people say it's going to go to. So that's my last message. And uh, I really want to thank you for bothering to turn up. You've been the best audience I've had all night. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we will also have a party need to leave to another engagement so you can just allow her to leave without any further questions. Um, we appreciate it. Thank you very much. Good night.